All right. Welcome to Women's Wellness Radio. Our guest today is Dr. Kayla Daniel. She is the author of a couple books. We are going to talk today about nourishing broth. She's also the author of The Whole Soy Story, The Dark Side of America's Favorite Health Food. Uh, so first of all, welcome, Kayla. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your show. I'm so excited to talk about broth and all the other areas of our health that can influence. Um, and this is our first ever video recording. So thank you for being my guinea pig. <laughs> really exciting. Um, what was I going to say? Um, so we'll always still have this as an audio. If you're listening to the podcast and you're wondering what I'm talking about, we'll keep it as an audio. But just to have the option to have video, if, you, if you'd like to see the conversation, you can go to uh, my YouTube channel or go to my website and, and take a look. So a little bit more about Dr. Daniel. She's a PhD and a CCN, and she's known as the naughty nutritionist because of her ability to outrageously and humorously debunk nutritional myths. She is the vice president of the Weston A. Price Foundation and on the board of directors of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. Dr. Kayla has been a guest on the Dr. Oz Show, PBS Healing Quest, NPR's People's Pharmacy, and many other shows, and has shared the stage with Dr. Mark Hyman, J.J. Virgin, Gary Tobbs, Joseph Marcola, Sally Fallon Moore, who's the co-author of the, this book, uh, Joel Salatin, and other prominent health experts. So, yeah, first of all, I did not know you were the vice president of the Western A. Price Foundation. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> So cool. If anybody's never checked that out, it's a, a great organization. And also the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund is something I support every year. I didn't know you were part of that. It's so great. Thank you. we got to support our farmers. Yeah, protecting the food access. It's so important. I always get their newsletter and I'm amazed at just some of the crazy stuff they're having to fight. So pretty cool. So you've got a book, a beautiful book that got, I looked on Amazon. I think you have 100% five-star reviews. <laughs> well, we just got our first negative one, so. Oh, you did? So <laughs> well. <laughs> We've got a lot of positive reviews. We'll say that. It looks like it's available on, on a Kindle book and a paper book um, called Nourishing Broth. And it was just released this last September. Is that right? That's right. And it's been doing very, very well. And I think the reason for that is it speaks to people's need to be nourished and have food that's warm and comforting and tastes good. And there's so many health benefits, too. That's great. So, yeah, tell us a little bit more about its healing benefits. You know, is that a myth or, you know, what's the science behind that? I think it's something people have instinctively understood going all the way back to the Stone Age, that soup is very, very nourishing. It's also part of the whole nose-to-tail eating, the idea that Mother Nature in her wisdom meant us to use all parts of the animals. In other words, we should not be just having the muscle meats, the shakes, the steaks and the chops, for example. So that would include soup made from the carcass, made from the skin, and also let's not forget the organ meats. So we need all of those to be very, very healthy. And one thing I'd like to point out is that the paleo movement has been beneficial to many, many men and women. But there's one mistake a lot of people make, and that is to focus on going back to meat and people focus on skinless, uh, boneless chicken breasts and the steaks and the chops and, and those parts of the animal when we really need to be eating nose to tail. And so the soup is a huge part of that. Okay. Yeah. It's a great point. I think you can tell us more about it, but there's a certain amino acid profile in the flesh meat and another amino acid profile in the cartilage. So, so when we're talking about making broth and using the whole animal, what parts do we use to make broth? Well, let's say we're making chicken broth, which is the one most people start with. And of course, there's a long, long history of chicken soup. It's considered a Jewish penicillin. It's supposed to heal everything that ails us. And it speaks to emotional issues, too. I mean, think of Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield's book series, you know, the mm -hmm. phenomenally successful chicken soup for the soul. If people didn't totally understand the nourishment of chicken soup, that title wouldn't resonate. So if we're making chicken, chicken broth, 
Uh, I'll just give people a tip on how I do it because we're all really busy and some people are intimidated. They think it's going to mean they're going to spend hours over the soup pot on the stove and so forth. And actually these days, soup can be a fast food because we have slow cookers and crock pots. We can go to work in the morning, throw a few things in the pot, turn it on low, come back home in the evening and voila, the food is just about ready to go. Okay. So with the chicken soup, what I like to do in my household, because it's so easy, is say on a Sunday, I'll roast a chicken, and we'll enjoy that. And I've got a small family, so there'll still be some meat left over for chicken curry or chicken salad or whatever else we'd like to make for a second meal. And at that point, I've got the chicken carcass. So it goes right into that crock pot with a little cider vinegar, uh, plenty of good quality water, some celery, some onions, uh, maybe some carrots, and the crock pot goes on. And hours later, the whole house smells wonderful and I've got the soup. So I'm going to then cool it off a little bit and then put it in the refrigerator. And most people will choose to skim off the fat on the top. And it's not that fat is evil. I'm certainly a big proponent of healthy fats. But when it comes to chicken soup, that fat is a little overcooked and it, it's full of the scum as well. And if you want a clear soup and a tasty soup, you might want to get rid of that. Okay. You just sum that up. It's just so easy. That's great. So my one question is, you know, some people who maybe never ro roasted a whole chicken because um, they just buy a chicken breast, right? They do. And, you know, there's a, an easy way for them to uh, say they go to Whole Foods and they buy one of those rotisserie chickens. They enjoy that. And then they toss that into the crock pot and they can get some wonderful broth that way, too. And one of the good things about doing a, a, a soup that way is you've got all the flavors from whatever herbs you're using. So you're going to get your broth already flavored nicely, whereas if you're just starting with, with say, the chicken, which, of course, you can do, too, you're going to have the, the basic plain chicken flavor and then, of course, later make whatever soup you'd like with whatever vegetables, whatever spices. Okay, that makes sense. So when you said start it in the morning and cook it with celery and, and that kind of thing, do you use that celery in the soup or is that kind of just now you've got the broth? And now you add in like kind of fresher, crunchier vegetables, so to speak. That's what I would do uh, because at the point celery and onions have cooked for hours and hours, they're pretty much spent. So I will toss all of those and start over um, sauteing some fresh onions, carrots, celery, and maybe I'm just making a simple chicken rice soup. So with some rice that I've made and those vegetables, absolutely wonderful. Maybe some red peppers in there. Okay, perfect, perfect. So you're telling us some recipes already. Tell us more about the book. Like, is it full of recipes or is it also just, you know, nutritional information? It's, uh, it's a broth Bible. It's got all of that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, about uh, half the book is full of recipes with a lot of frequently asked questions and how-to tips and different ways to do it. And the basic stock or broth that you can then use for soups and stews or if you're feeling really industrious in the summer, maybe you want to make aspects. You know, that would be a natural, healthy jello, you know, without the green color. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, cool. You know, not everybody wants a warm broth in the in the summer, but a lot of people are finding they enjoy broth, a cup of broth or what Florence Nightingale called meat tea instead of coffee in the morning. Oh, yeah, that's great. So this is going to be a good segue to talk about some of the health benefits. Like why would someone besides, you know, maybe it's got a nice flavor, you're learning to make broth well, and you've got maybe got some nice ginger in there. Besides the flavor, what are some other benefits of having a cup of broth in the morning? Well, the benefit that people know best is, is why uh, chicken soup is called Jewish penicillin. And it has a pronounced antimicrobial effect, so it's wonderful in the winter when everybody's so afraid of colds and flus and so forth. So perfect for winter, both preventively and should you become sick. And uh, broth traditionally has been used for convalescent cookery. Um, that sounds like an old-fashioned phrase. And it was actually used all the time in 19th and early 20th century cookbooks. They would always have a chapter on what they called convalescent cookery or invalid cookery. 
And Florence Nightingale, in her book, Notes on Nursing, she was talking about the fact that all of us, men and women both, at some point in our lives are probably going to be nursing a child or a parent or a friend, that all of us have some nursing in our lives. So she's talking about uh, the foods that are easy to digest and can help people recover from accidents or illness. So uh, soup is right there, you know, easy <laughs> to digest and good. Yeah, yeah, very nourishing and easy, easy to eat if you're sick in bed. It's so cool we're talking about Florence Nightingale right now. It's just so awesome. She's a powerful woman. And when we were in school, we had this vision of this woman, you know, the lady with the lamp going to the beds and comforting. But, boy, she was a powerful woman, a uh, uh, pioneer in statistics, a pioneer in public health. And she knew how to take action and get things accomplished. I mean, Florence Nightingale got the celebrity chef of her era to go with her to the Crimean War so those soldiers could have good broth made. I mean, wow. that's just got fed the best. So tell us some of the history, even predating Florence Nightingale's time, the history of broth. Well, it goes all the way back to the Stone Age when people didn't even have a pot to cook in. They oh, were sorry. actually, somebody probably realized when they were cooking steaks or, or meat over a spit, you know, on a spit over the fire, that some of those good juices were leaking and they didn't want to lose any of them. So they started catching them. And then they got the bright idea of cooking, say, in an animal skin. So we see these old etchings. I mean, this is obviously, you know, long after the Stone Age. But people were innovative. If they didn't have a pot, they found a way to take take animal skins and string them up and make a pot out of those. That's amazing. And think about a turtle shell. They catch a turtle and they cook the turtle in its own pot. <laughs> oh wow! So they just put that over the fire and they. Yeah. And we can pretend, you know, it's as nourishing or, or the kind of gourmet food we, we now would like. But wherever we go in the world, there are soups and stews as part of the menu and different spices, different vegetables, different flavors in fashion. Uh, in some cultures, maybe more cooking with hot peppers, more cooking with garlic. Mm -hmm. hot. You know, everyone's got their preferences. But wherever you go, people were honoring Mother Nature's wisdom and also being frugal, using all parts of the animal. And we need those bones. We need the marrow in the bones and the skin. Yeah. Chicken skin is so nourishing. Yeah. Tell us some of the scientific properties that you know, some of these parts have. Well, there's a lot. Now, as you'd expect, there's very, very few studies of broth itself because nobody does research unless there's a way to market it, to turn it into pills or powders or potions or something you can patent. Mm -hmm. So there's no financial incentive to study soup. And that would be very difficult to study anyway because everybody makes it differently and our soup or our broth is going to vary from pot to pot depending on what kind of bones we're using in it. Is it going to be lamb or chicken or beef or a mixture? Are we using knuckle bones? Are we using tracheal bones? How many chicken feet are we putting in? Every pot of it's going to be different. So that makes it challenging to do studies. But what we do have is a whole lot of studies on the components of broth. So from the 19th century through the early 20th century, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of studies on gelatin. And gelatin is the collagen component of broth. And those of us who don't want to make bone broth from scratch because of the yuck factor, maybe they don't want to handle bones, or maybe they're ex-vegetarians and they're coming around for their health, but they don't <laughs> want to deal with the, with the corpse. So um, gelatin or collagen peptides, a lot of studies on those, including some recent studies. But in the 19th century, early 20th century, that was an industry. People thought they could save the world with gelatin. They thought they could solve malnutrition. And sadly, um, you can't live on gelatin or, for that matter, broth alone. But that doesn't mean it's not a very, very important part of a healthy diet that we need. So lots of studies on gelatin, but then we get into the amino acids, and as you mentioned earlier, there are amino acids that are high in quantity in broth as opposed to muscle meats. They're different profile. 
So a lot of people who do too many muscle meats have a diet that's got too much methionine, which can cause problems, and then they're going to be low in proline, glycine, and glutamine. Mm -hmm. And those are all conditionally essential amino acids, which is to say that the body theoretically can produce them from the essential amino acids we get. But in reality, most of us are just not healthy enough to do that. And Mother Nature actually provided for us to get plenty of those if we had a balanced diet that was, well, back to that nose-to-tail eating. So in the broth, we're going to get a lot of proline and glycine and glutamine, and that's what we need for gut health. That's what we need for joint health. Everybody thinks they're going to get arthritis when they get older. There's an epidemic of it. People think it's nothing we can do about it. But you know, not everyone gets arthritis, and people who eat a lot of broth seem to have healthier knees and joints. And think about it, really good for people who are in fitness. You go to so many gyms and people can't do this or that because they've got knee problems. So let's get broth into those people. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm just thinking of some of my clients that I'm treating right now with injuries, and I, you know, I'm not... I'm definitely a broth fan and a gelatin fan, and I'm just not talking about it enough. So just got to get them to listen to this podcast by your book. <laughs> so one, one thing, thing is people, people love it once they start. They, the people are, I get so many emails, people saying, oh, my, feel, my body feels nourished for the first time ever. You know, you feel nourished in a way you just don't when you're just taking extra pills. Yeah, it's a good point. And like you said, it's not like we have to cook it in an animal skin over a fire. Like we have a crock pot. Uh, bones are very affordable. Or like you said, just, you know, if you're if you don't if you're new to all this, just roast, you know, buy a roasted chicken. Start there. Such great advice. I think I heard once, Dr. Kayla, that if you're just eating muscle meat and not some of the parts, so to speak, then you can have a, like a tendency towards depression, some of that amino acid imbalance. Is that correct? Uh, that could be part of it. Well, there's, of course, you know, multiple reasons for depression. Right. But I think what you're mentioning, which is a very imbalanced diet, Mm. Um, that when we're getting more of the nutrition that we find in broth, people tend to level out more. So uh, that becomes very important. And perhaps part of that whole picture also is people are less likely to be depressed if they're, if they're nourishing themselves. And I mean, on every, you know, in every way, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And there's just something about having a meal with, with friends or family, you know, sitting down for a meal. I mean, there's families where that never happens anymore. <laughs> And that has a, that's a very hard thing to measure, but the community that you get from, say, knowing your farmers, from preparing and eating meals with other people, that I think is, is very healing for many, many people just to, just to start that up. That's a good point. You, you, I like how you keep bringing this to the big picture. And I, I think that when I read that or learned that information, it was like, yeah, like you're talking about the paleo movement, can people can maybe get part of it and 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 maybe not be getting the other part. Like they, you know, oh, I'll eat more meat, I'll have more like boneless, skinless chicken breast and steamed vegetables. But you've got to get in. You can't have that fear of fat. You've got to get in the fat and eat the whole animal. And and like you said, that's just a more balanced approach to eating and living and, and it's good for the brain, you know, the good fats and, you know, the amino acid balance and all that, I would imagine. Yeah, the fat is a huge component for a lot of people, and maybe it's a big improvement for them to have gone from, say, a vegan diet, a low-fat diet, into a more uh, wide-ranging, varied, omnivorous diet. But a lot of people, because they've been low-fat for a long time, are having trouble digesting fat. So we got to do everything we can to take them, even if it's by baby steps, to include all of the animal that Mother Nature designed us to eat. And yeah, it's not just the carcass and it's not just the skin, it's the fat under the skin. And in the case of chicken fat, that's actually a monounsaturated fat. Hmm, okay. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with saturated fat, but um, we need all of those things. And fear of fat and fear of this and fear of that, it's one reason people are not feeling good about their lives. I often will tell people, you know, relax. You know, I get questions like, what is the best 
what is the absolute best broth? What is the exact proportion of bones of this type and that type I can have for the perfect broth? What is exactly how much glutamine I'm going to get? And, you know, it's relax, you know, just make it and enjoy it. Yeah. And I think also people, in, including me, my, my, my mom was a great cook, but I didn't really learn to cook early on. A lot of people don't know how to cook. So they're kind of like, oh, you know, their fear of experimenting in the kitchen, I think, is in the beginning. And then hopefully over time, I mean, definitely just having this conversation and looking into your book, you know, I'm mas- making broth mostly the same way all the time. And I, it's time for me to to mix it up so you can't just experiment it sounds like and you can experiment um there's so many things you can do and one of the things i've done is uh years ago i was a vegetarian for a while and i've got all of those old cookbooks and some of the recipes i still love but now i i update them to include broth so if it's a it's if it's a lentil soup i make it even better by making it with a ham hock and quite frankly, people worry too much about being good cooked. You put something like a ham hock in there, and um, you'll have a reputation in your whole community. <laughs> you cannot go wrong if you make a bean soup that way. You know, black bean soup, white bean soup, lentil soup, split pea soup. Um, use a ham hock, and it will be delicious absolutely every time. Yeah, I got to do that. I but I do use broth, but I don't use a ham hock. So that I'm going to have to try that. And yeah, broth is so diverse. Again, we're having this conversation about drinking broth. And I frankly, I rarely drink it. I got to get more into that. But I put it in everything. You know, I cook rice with it or, you know, any soup I make is with broth. If I'm making a stir fry and I need some moisture, I put in broth. So I, yeah, I want to let people know it's pretty diverse what you can do with it if you're not, maybe not used to just drinking it yet. I think that's a really good point and one of the ways I work with with my clients to get more broth into them is maybe they don't want to drink three cups a day and they don't want soup with every single meal but as you pointed out instead of using water when you're making rice you can use broth and your rice will taste better and you can do the same thing with say quinoa. And there's a whole lot of people right now who are afraid of any grains and even the non-gluten containing grains. And they become a whole lot more digestible and nourishing if we have the broth in there. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so I'd love to to talk a little bit about minerals and broth. Um, I encourage people to, you know, when they when I say perhaps suggest to cut down on dairy, they say, well, where am I going to get my calcium? And I mentioned I mentioned broth, but you're you're the broth expert. I'd love for you to tell us more about what minerals are in broth. Well, whatever minerals are found in bones. But what is surprising is that we did some studies and found that the levels are actually really low, even of calcium. Mm. So that was immediately a concern because people who aren't doing dairy were thinking that broth could be a good substitute and because it's bone broth, we're going to get a whole lot of calcium. But in fact, even when it's been cooked a long, long time, the calcium levels are low. Now, we may benefit perfectly well from the low levels because they're probably extremely bioavailable. But when I really started looking into it, I recognized that the reason we have so many reports of people building good quality bones and recovering from osteopenia or even osteoporosis with using a lot of bone broth is because bone, the, the framework of bones is collagen. So the calcium is slapped onto the framework of collagen. So the collagen is actually more important than the calcium in terms of our building healthy, strong, and flexible bones. Okay. It's, like, it's like concrete if you're you know, constructing. You need the rebar or the concrete is not going to be very stable at all. That makes sense. Yeah, and there's, I know there's a lot of debate on how much calcium do we need and is it safe to supplement with. What is your opinion on any of that? Well, um, to you know, further answer the question about broth, we're going to get plenty of collagen from a well-made broth, and the sign of that will be that the broth gels and it gets really jiggly. So if we've got a good jiggly broth, we can count on a lot of collagen in there. So then most people are going to make soups and stews, so they're going to add some vegetables, they're going to get some good calcium in the vegetables. If you're making something like a bean soup, um, fairly close to the time you want to serve it, you can add into it something like kale. 
you know, we don't want to cook kale a long time where you're going to have the worst tasting broth ever. You know, it's going to be nasty. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> a strong soup, say like a bean soup that's made with, with that ham hock and some kale in it, you're going to get calcium from the kale. If you're making a cream soup with dairy, you can, um, of course, get your calcium that way. Or if you include uh, some good quality um, calcium supplements, I think good quality is a really important thing. You know, the calcium hydroxapatite being recommended for many people, but you know, all of us clinicians, we all have our own, you know, preferences. But people, people will say to me, and this is getting off on the soy tangent. I need to drink my soy milk or my rice milk because it's got added calcium. And what I'm pointing out to those people is that the calcium they add to those dairy alternative milks is the worst quality calcium, hard to absorb. And that is not an excuse to eat these dreadful products. If you need to supplement, take a good quality supplement and stop worrying mm -hmm. about the fake milk products with their low quality calcium. That's a really good point that I think people don't realize. It's it's almost like a marketing ploy to say, oh, you know, high in calcium, because they're going to put the cheapest stuff possible in there. Mm -hmm. That's it. Probably even like the good brands would do the same, I would imagine. Well, they all do, and they also all include vitamin D too, because see, they're they're pandering to the vegan market, so they want to have D two in there, and that's not the vitamin D that we can use and benefit from. In fact, there's some uh, reasons to not want to include supplemental vitamin D two. So let's just stay off those those products. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> So I'd love for you to talk about maybe some of the micro minerals and some of the effects uh, that could potentially come for anxiety with having broth. Uh, a lot of the amino acids, the proline, the glycine, uh, the glutamine, that can all help balance out the brain. And some people these days are afraid of glutamine. They associate it with MSG, which it is not. But we do have some people who, because they have leaky gut and some other problems, have to start out with a short-cooked broth with, that is low in glutamine or else things get worse for them. And some of what would get worse would be the anxiety. Because, see, in the brain, um, if everything's working properly, we're either going, it's either going to go down the excitatory pathway, which is something we need, you know, sometimes, or down the calming pathway. And when people are not well, sometimes it's all excitatory and none of the GABA or the calming stuff kicks in. So we need to heal ourselves and we ultimately need the glutamine for both purposes. But temporarily, sometimes people have to start out slowly. Wow. I definitely would have thought of that. That's really interesting. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So maybe just good to know, like if you're dealing with something like that to, to read your book and learn some of the nuances. Yeah. Some people uh, report that they do not do well with broth and they probably desperately need it, but they have to start out very slowly. And with people who are on the GAPS diet or the Guts and Psychology Syndrome diet, most people on, in the startup phase are going to use what would be a short-cooked broth that is low in not only in glutamine but all the amino acids. And they do some gut healing slowly but surely, and in time, hopefully, they can, they can enjoy the fully beneficial, rich, nourishing broth. That's very interesting. So let's talk more about the gut. I, I think the broth is maybe most famous for the gut. So what does it do for the gut? Well, uh, the broth heals the gut. And, you know, we all talk about whatever the symptom is, first heal the gut. And it goes back to Hippocrates and all of us in alternative medicine, regardless of what people complain of, we, we first work on the gut, don't we? Okay. <laughs> So uh, there's the, the soothing effect that, that helps heal the gut lining. And uh, also going back to that brain topic, the brain is in the gut. You know, a lot of your brain is in the gut, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> and just your immune system is in the gut. So that's a lot of what it's about. Uh, and most of the studies on the proline, glycine, glutamine, and glutamine especially, uh, and that's one of the reasons that people who are, are healing from, say, drug treatments or whatever may need to 
you supplemental glutamine in order to to heal the gut. Now, of course, the food source of that is, guess what? We're back to broth again. Okay. Yeah, and I want to talk a little bit more about immunity in the gut because I think that people still don't totally get it. Like they get a cold and they're like, oh, it's going around or, or whatever. And and when you say the immune system's in the gut, I think it could be hard without some background to understand why. So we can say it was the gut-associated lymphoid tissue is in the gut, so it's responding. You've got that barrier to... So let's say we are eating some food or touching our mouths and getting some bacteria or virus. We've got that layer in the gut, the mucosal layer, to protect us. Um, tell, tell us more. Anything I'm missing about the, the relationship there? So the, the broth is providing the nutritional components that help us build that uh, strong and flexible barrier because we want a barrier that lets the right things in and keeps the wrong things out. And uh, so it has to be both strong and flexible. Okay, great. So that's, we talked a little bit, we talked earlier about cold and flu and just now, and then, and there's kind of the, the deeper, more chronic issue about autoimmune disorders, which, you know, this is a show geared towards women and women are more prone to autoimmune disorders. So how can drinking broth and healing the gut help with autoimmune disorder control or prevention? Well, this might seem to be the most um, surprising finding, and it certainly was for me. But I was very blessed that back in 1997, I interviewed the late Dr. John F. Pruden. And uh, Dr. Pruden's work is pretty much forgotten at this point, but he was known as the father of cartilage therapy. And he did studies for many years with bovine tracheal cartilage supplements, nine grams a day, which with most products, uh, that would be 12 pills a day, so pretty big dose of that. And uh, he discovered, first of all, uh, he was a surgeon in the Korean War, and he was looking for solutions to do wound healing. So then he accidentally found that cartilage chips put on wounds started to heal them very rapidly. And then he noticed it was healing other things, and then he got interested in um, cartilage injections and then cartilage pills, so many, many years of study in cartilage. And along the way, he started to discover that it was healing all sorts of things that he never expected. So he started doing studies with osteoarthritis and found that that was actually helping cartilage. You know, feeding cartilage supplements was helping the cartilage to regenerate. And his patients were incurable. I mean, they were facing major surgery. They were totally crippled. So they were not, you know, borderline people. Uh, it was serious cases. So he was turning that around to everyone's astonishment. And then he got thinking, well, if it's helped cartilage with osteoarthritis, let's see what it will do with rheumatoid arthritis. Same effect. And then he uh, started noticing that it also was healing psoriasis. It was healing, believe it or not, scleroderma. And these were all terrible, terrible cases. That it was psoriasis patients where the scaling was all over their bodies, where mm -hmm. people were so, so um, embarrassed and uncomfortable with what was going on, they could not go outdoors. So they were terrible cases, and scleroderma is almost always irreversible. So he was turning around all of these cases, and then he discovered uh, when working with a woman who had a wound on her chest from basically terminal breast cancer, and his in initial thought was, we're just going to help her with that wound. You know, there's no way we can reverse the cancer. You know, she's going to die anyway, but let's help her be more comfortable in the meantime. Well, the cancer turned around. Wow. So now you might be asking at this point, so what does all this have to do with broth? Well, the thing is, if we're making homemade broth from bones, we're going to get plenty of cartilage in there too. And especially if we're using a lot of knuckle bones and joint bones. So if from the time we're little children, we have plenty of soups and stews and gelatin and things like that in our diet, we may never develop some of these problems. So for a lot of us, the broth every single day, soups and stews, and you know, a really varied diet, should have a lot of good preventive effects. 
And for people who are already having some health challenges, I would say broth, soups, and stews as a dietary foundation, easy to digest, heal the gut, and can help with the other things too. And if it's really serious, consider actually supplementing with Dr. Dr. Pruden's cartilage prescription. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no downside to it other than you have, you have to take a lot of pills and, you know, there is some cost to it, of course. Okay. But okay. Uh, just fascinating. But again, it's back to how the research is on components that we have in broth, you know, rather than bowls of soup itself. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, I, you know, prevention is such a boring thing to think about, so to speak. But I think it's important for women to know that we are prone to these autoimmune disorders. And once we get them, we can really just manage them. So, and they come on often at times like um, after pregnancy or in menopause, you know, we're more likely to get them because of our hormonal changes is one reason. And because I think from what I've read, our immune systems behave a little differently than men. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's important to think about. You don't want to be on the on the other end of getting this diagnosis. So some good advice about prevention and treatment both. Um, awesome. Well, I think I've, yeah, I think we've got a, a good enough reason to go buy your book now. <laughs> so we can wrap it up. <laughs> Tell us more about how to get the book and other things that, that you offer. Well, I'd like to invite everyone to visit the website nourishingbroth.com. And that's the title of our book, Nourishing Broth. Uh, but at the website, we've got some freebies. Um, I've got Be Super, you know, tips on being healthy and having high energy. And Sally Fallon Morell, my co-author, she's got some extra helpings, some extra recipes. And the main thing being that's where we're building our broth making community. That's where we've got all the frequently asked questions. And trust me, we get a lot of questions, you know, with a lot of people starting to make broth and wanting to know how to make it well. So um, nourishingbroth.com. Great. And of course, from there, you can click through and get the book. And, and also uh, our recommended collagen and cartilage and slow cookers and, you know, broth making products. Awesome. Sure. Yeah, maybe I can go on there and share the, some of these recordings. And I've got a little broth video I could share if you want it. <laughs> Yeah, I had a local chef. Uh, we made a video together, and he's really super. And I just, you know, I, I met him as a client, and I was like, I love that you're making broth and using it at your restaurant. That's so cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so some of the fine dining is another place that you can you can get broth, which is interesting. Well, what is happening is there's a whole broth revival, and there's some really top restaurants that are making broth in the old-fashioned way. Now, most restaurants still do not do that, so you really have to ask questions. But there's Brodo in New York, and there's been a whole lot of publicity, and people are going there every morning, and they're getting an $8 cup of broth instead of their their Starbucks. Oh, that's now. awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think he serves broth on its own. He just uses it in dishes for the rich flavor mostly. But, you know, for me, I was like, wow, that's so nutritious. So I'll, I'll drop his restaurant's name is Trifecta, and it's here in Portland. So if you ever come to town. I'm coming to Portland this weekend. Are you serious? <laughs> How funny. Uh, Nutritional Therapy Association meeting. I'm uh, speaking. That's awesome. Well, well, we'll talk offline and maybe we can uh, get together and enjoy some broth. Absolutely. I'd love to. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kella. Super informative. Great information. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Bridget. All right. Talk to you later. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye.